process that goes into all our uh, work. And um, it's not that it wasn't there before, but really the idea was to bring much more focus uh, into making sure that not only is our guidance scientifically excellent, technically excellent and the best that it could be, but also that it's relevant, it's answering the needs of people in, uh, on the ground who are, who are grappling with a number of uh, challenges in our member states. It's timely and it's delivered in a way that is easy for people to adopt and implement. So for example, we're trying to move to computable guidelines now, um, also living guidelines so that we're constantly updating and it's not five or 10 years that you have to wait before we do a, a new set of uh, paper uh, books on, on guidelines. So they're making many, many changes and the idea really is to translate knowledge as soon as possible. First of all, to capture new knowledge and then to translate it into policy, into practice at the country level. And this is where the three levels of the organization have to work uh, very closely together. So that's just a brief introduction. And we've played a big role now in this COVID response as well. The science division's really been, been in the center of it. Uh, thank you, uh, Sumia. We, I think we are ready to take questions. Uh, I see that Jamil uh, wants to uh, ask the first question. Jamil, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Go ahead, Jamil. Perfect. Thank you for this opportunity, Fadela and Dr. Sumia. Uh, my question uh, is about, and apologies for bringing this back to the issue, but um, chloroquine. Um, the, the fact that yesterday we had uh, an announcement that was a little bit confusing, to be honest, from the outside world. Uh, first, if you could explain exactly what are the next steps uh, in terms of this, because it was said yesterday that it's not a WHO uh, statement, but what does that mean? That at one point you're going to go back, or what is it? And secondly, on the same issue, uh, Brazil uh, insists that it will not only uh, continue giving it, but it will even broaden uh, the use of uh, this medicine. Do you do you recommend do you recommend what Brazil is doing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Let me try to explain. So, from the beginning of this pandemic, you know, we had this research and innovation forum in February, where we brought together the world's leading scientists and academics to develop a research roadmap for COVID-19, and the focus was on understanding more about the virus and its natural history and transmission and epidemiology, but also on trying to develop as rapidly as possible treatments and diagnostics, and then of course vaccines. Now, when it came to treatments, what was done early on was to look at existing drugs, because it's much easier to take existing drugs which are already safe for use in humans, which are licensed in countries, which can be used rapidly, and test to see if it has any activity against this new pathogen. And therefore, a number of drugs which have been used for other diseases, including many antiviral drugs, uh, like anti-HIV drugs and anti-influenza drugs, but also drugs like hydroxychloroquine, which in the past have shown activity against other viruses in lab settings, what were looked at. And there were some early signs that hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine had some activity in suppressing viral replication in, in the lab, and then some early reports that came out of China that suggested that it may have some beneficial effects. These were small case series. So our expert group looked at a huge range of drugs and recommended four or five of them, which are worth testing in clinical trials. And that's how the solidarity trial had four arms. So it had hydroxychloroquine, it had remdesivir, which is a, a new antiviral drug that's been tested for Ebola before. Lopinavir, ritonavir combination is anti-HIV drug, and also lopinavir, ritonavir with interferon uh, 1 beta. So this trial started uh, at the end of March, and um, so far has recruited about 4,500 patients. It's, uh, it, I think it's an incredible uh, uh, accomplishment to have launched a trial in 20 countries at hundreds of hospitals with so many participating physicians and patients. Now, what happens in a clinical trial is there's a, it's a, it's a randomized, uh, so you have a central randomization unit which runs out of here, out of Geneva, 
And a physician in a participating hospital has to fill out a short form, all electronic. There's no paper involved. They have to answer a set of, first they have to be registered as a participant, then they answer some questions. They're, then the uh, information comes to the randomization center and a code is sent to them. The code tells them which drug to, to use. So it's randomly done across, across the world. And um, the, there were many other trials, of course, going on, also using hydroxychloroquine and others. Especially the largest trial is the UK's um, recovery trial, which till now has um, enrolled 11,000 patients. So what happened is that about 10 days ago, the recovery trial actually looked at their data. They did an interim data analysis, and their data safety monitoring board suggested that there is no benefit because they had enrolled enough numbers to be able to analyze hydroxychloroquine versus those who had standard of care, and they said that there was no um, benefit uh, in mortality seen, which was the endpoint used. So the UK recovery trial and the WHO solidarity trial use very similar, almost identical protocols because it was developed by WHO's group of experts and then adopted by recovery. So it's easy actually to compare the results from these two. And so at the same time, we uh, also, our data safety monitoring uh, committee, an independent committee, looked at the interim data from our uh, trial and we found that there was no mortality benefit uh, in the patients receiving hydroxychloroquine compared to the control arm. So the UK's recovery trial and the solidarity trial, if you really put them together, the large number of patients where there's no benefit. And so it was decided that there was no point in continuing. It's what we call futility. When you are convinced that there is no benefit, then you do not keep on continuing. That's one of the principles of, of clinical trials. And that was the way our trial was set up, to be an adaptive trial. So the steering group, which advises the trial, and the DSMC, which provided the data, decided that there was, uh, the steering group took the decision, the executive group took the decision that uh, this arm should be dropped. Now what are we doing? We're looking at the uh, interim results of another uh, arm, which is the lopinavir, uh, ritonavir arm, uh, to see whether there's any, uh, any uh, signal there, because the, the recovery trial also has this drug in their, uh, and they, uh, again, enrolled a large number of patients. As a global community, what do we want? We want clear answers to these questions. We want to know whether a drug reduces mortality or not. And if it doesn't, does it have any other beneficial effects like reducing hospitalization or the need for ventilation? Uh, if those benefits are there, then we want patients to get it. But if there aren't, we want everybody to know that there's no point in continuing. So we have the same situation with lopinavir, ritonavir now, which we will be, uh, will be looking at and then deciding on whether we, um, we um, should change the, the uh, other arms in the, in the trial. But we will come to that later. Now, you asked an important question about policy uh, and that there was some confusion. Uh, I think the decision about hydroxychloroquine is limited to the use in the solidarity trial. Treatment guidelines are made slightly differently. Treatment guidelines are not based on interim results of one trial. We look at all the evidence that's out there. We do what is called a pooled analysis or a meta-analysis. And then there's a guideline development group that's already set up for COVID-19, which will look at the consolidated evidence on hydroxychloroquine, on lopinavir, ritonavir, on remdesivir, on dexamethasone, and make recommendations as to whether pe people should use it or not use it. Where there's a lack of evidence, we say, there is still a lack of evidence, and we are waiting for more uh, trials. As far as the use of hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis or prevention of uh, COVID-19, either before or after exposure, the last word is not yet out. I think there are some good and big trials going on, and we hope those will be completed so that we will have the kind of evidence that we need to make sure that uh, patients receive the uh, drugs which help and do not receive drugs which do not help. There are countries which have made their own national guidelines and they are free to do so. We have what is called off-label use of drugs 
uh, we have a, a scientific brief on our website which describes how can you use, how can countries use drugs which are not yet indicated for a particular purpose. So that um, they have that degree of freedom, but hopefully all countries will have evidence-based guidelines. As more and more evidence becomes available, these treatment guidelines should be refined to reflect the state of knowledge and the state of science. Uh, thank you, Sumia. Uh, now we will go to uh, Bloomberg. I think we have two reporters, Corinne and Thomas. Maybe we start with Corinne. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, I think it has the art of pandemics. Is this or does it have the potential to be the most devastating outbreak in the last century? <laughs> We're still in the middle of it. Uh, we don't know where we are. In fact, it's only been six months since it started. It certainly looks like it's one of the most serious challenges that we've had in global health in the last century. I don't think anybody alive today has lived through um, a true pandemic, which is what we're into. So none of us can afford to take it lightly. We hope that because we live, we're live, living 100 years from 1918, which was the last flu pandemic, which killed you know millions and millions of people around the world, science has advanced a lot. And to think of the, of the fact that you can have vaccines made within two months of a genetic sequence of a new virus being released and into human clinical trial, that was unimaginable. There were no drugs or vaccines in 1918. So I hope the world can, um, can um, use its resources and scientists um, uh, in a way, public and private sector in a way that we can actually interrupt the natural course of this pandemic, which seems to be very, very uh, uh, serious, the way it's spreading around the world. So I think we have that opportunity where, where human beings can now intervene uh, but at the same time, you know, um, we always say the virus is smart. This virus is, is dangerous. We should not underestimate this virus. So we have to keep an eye uh, on what it's doing as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. We move now to Lisa Schlein, Voice of America. Lisa, Li, uh, Lisa can you hear us? Lisa? Yeah, I've unmuted myself. Um, I, I, I can never pronounce the name of the drug. I, I, I hexachlorophene, right? <laughs> Hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I a follow up to um, Jamil's question and then, and then another, uh, my own question, all right? Um, I, I understand there is a, it, there is so much uh, conflicting information about uh, the trials that have gone on, you've explained some of this, but I understand there is a big trial underway with uh, many nurses in uh, so different countries about the use of uh, this drug as a preventive measure. Is is that correct? I mean, does this seem like uh, it's it's actually uh, is something that that might work that uh, that could could be available? I mean, is this something that? you think is important, this particular research. And then um, um, I have a follow-up question in that currently how many vaccines and drugs are under research and how many of them are promising? And one more question on this is there is so much conflicting uh, conjecture about uh, will will a vaccine be available at the end of the year? Maybe it'll be next year. Maybe it'll take two years. What's your guess? <laughs> You're a scientist, so you don't guess. So what is your actual factual uh, information that you have on this? Thank you. Thank you. A uh, set of interesting questions. Thank you for those. Uh, just to finish up with the hydroxychloroquine, yes, you're right. There are a couple of large randomized trials going on to test hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic or a preventive in um, healthcare workers and in others who are exposed to the uh, virus. Um, now, what 
is clear now as hydroxychloroquine does not seem to have or does not have, we, we know for sure now, does not have an impact uh, on the disease course on mortality in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Where there is still a gap is does it have any role at all in prevention or in minimizing the, the severity of the illness in, in early infection uh, or even in preventing infection? We don't know that as yet. And we need to complete those large trials and get the data. So again, we have a definitive answer on that. So I hope that the, those trials will be, will be completed. Um, the question on therapeutics and vaccines, yes. So we are tracking the drugs that are being um, tested, evaluated across the world. We, we maintain a database. Many other people are doing that. There are also groups that are continuously updating the evidence on a particular drug or a group of drugs, and you know we link that also in our website. It's uh, very good that uh, so many uh, efforts are going on around the world. What we would like to encourage is more of randomized clinical trial evidence, uh, if possible, in large enough numbers to have conclusive uh, proof. Uh, what happened in the early stages of this pandemic, and it's natural, I think, everyone was trying to do their best in the given circumstances. You had a number of small studies coming out, um, which perhaps contributed a little bit towards the confusion that has arisen. Because one study would say, yes, it seems to be working. The next study would say, no, it doesn't work at all. But we're talking about small uh, numbers, 50, 100, you know, 200 at the most. Uh, those are not definitive. And that now we have these large trials going on, which hopefully can answer. And some of the trials have been set up in a way that we can uh, keep adding more drugs to be tested. So, for example, the WHO Solidarity Trial has now asked its expert group to look at what are the drugs that seem to be on the horizon that are early in development, which could then be included once we finish you know, the existing uh, arms and we have the evidence. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, for example, there are several now coming into, into the clinical stages of testing. There are other drugs being uh, developed in universities and, and small biotech companies around the world. There are also, you know, this disease uh, is, is a viral infection, but it also seems to stimulate um, uh, an immune response, which can be damaging. So the, the mortality quite often is because of the overproduction of inflammatory substances in the body, cytokines and, and others, which damage the lung and which... Uh, attack other parts of other organs as well. So there is a role also for immune modulators, for drugs that modulate the immune response. So you have antiviral drugs, you have these immune modulator drugs, and then you have a class of antibodies. Um, there are trials going on now in convalescent plasma. You take the plasma or the blood from people who have recovered from the illness who have antibodies and use transfuse that into a person with uh, illness. Again, the clinical trials have not been completed, but this, it's a similar principle, but monoclonal antibodies are more specific. They're more targeted to the part of the uh, virus that actually attaches to the cell receptor. So you can be much more targeted and you could actually use it even as a preventative um, till a vaccine is developed. So there's, there are uh, many exciting opportunities now for testing of those. Turning to vaccines, again, huge activity uh, in this field, we have over, well, every day the number increases, but there are at least 200 plus vaccine candidates at some stage of development. But the ones that are the furthest along, there are about, about 10 candidates now which are in human testing. And, you know, we go through phase one, two, and three. Uh, three of those are uh, entering phase three very soon in the next couple of weeks. So there's the, um, the AstraZeneca, the Oxford Chadox vaccine, there's the Moderna's RNA vaccine that will be uh, tested by the NIH. And then there is a Chinese uh, vaccine. Uh, in fact, there are a couple of Chinese vaccine candidates that are showing uh, some promising results in phase one and two that are ready to go into phase three. So we're entering a new phase now, of vaccine trials, the phase three trials, which are the ones that will definitively prove whether a vaccine is efficacious and safe. I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, vaccine development is a, is a complex undertaking. Uh, it comes with a lot of uh, uncertainty. 
the good thing is we have many different vaccine candidates and platforms. So even if the first one fails or the second fails, we shouldn't lose hope. We shouldn't give up. There are DNA vaccines, RNA vaccines, inactivated vaccines, protein subunit vaccines and viral vectored vaccines. Every possible platform has been um, t tried by some company or the other. So we do have a, a very good pipeline. And the, again, this is where WHO wants to work with companies, with sponsors. And as you know, we have the ACT Accelerator now. And um, in the vaccine pillar, we're working closely with uh, CEPI and Gavi. And the idea really is to accelerate the development of as many vaccine candidates as possible, at least the ones that look promising initially. Take them through testing. Also, scale up manufacturing. What we uh, invest in manufacturing even before we know the vaccine will be successful so that the moment you have your results from the phase three, you're also able to produce a large number of, uh, of vaccines. So if we are very lucky, there will be one or two successful candidates before the end of this year. But till we see the results of those trials, and you know the trials are also difficult to do because you have to do them in places where there's infection going on. So for example, if you have a country that's developed a vaccine, but there's, they've been able to control their infection rates they necessarily have to look for other places for testing. And this is where, again, the global collaboration becomes uh, uh, important. Till we have vaccines and till we have uh, good uh, preventive uh, tools, we must and we have to follow the public health measures that WHO has been repeatedly emphasizing. You know, the make sure you're testing everybody who's symptomatic, isolating them, providing them care, our clinical management is getting better and better as we're learning about this disease. So you can actually reduce death by early detection of people, making sure they're in medical facilities where they can be monitored, that oxygen is available. And then, of course, doing the contact tracing and uh, the quarantining, reducing the transmission within the, uh, within the community, the physical distancing, the masking where physical distancing is not possible, the hand hygiene, the respiratory hygiene. We mustn't forget these are the very basic ones that have actually uh, helped many countries that have been able to control it. And hopefully once we get a vaccine, then, uh, uh, then we can relax on some of those, but uh, not for the next uh, foreseeable future anyway. Thank you, uh, Dr. Swaminathan. We have uh, a lot of journalists uh, lining up. We will take the next question from Gabriela. Gabriela? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, please. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to know how are you going to reconcile the issue of uh, in, in talking about vaccines <coughs> on intellectual property and access to vaccines in, in all countries? The, you know, I can understand that scientists who discover the vaccine will want to be recognized for that. I mean, it's going to be like the discovery of the century. But uh, yeah, I, I had this, these questions on that. And then um, if you can uh, recommend something uh, to strengthen the immune system, not, not treat COVID, but I mean, for people to be stronger in case that they got the infection, like the vitamins or something like that. And the, the third question is, may I, if, uh, if you are familiar with the use of Tocilucimab, hmm. Tocilucimab, uh, apparently in Mexico it's giving a, a good result. So I don't know if there are clinical trials or if you're familiar with this medicine. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I forgot the first one. Let me start with Tocilucimab. The, the patent. Ah, the patent issue. We'll come to that. So IL, the tocilizumab is an IL-6 inhibitor. There are other uh, um, such uh, biologic, bi what we call the biologic products, which are uh, acting against the uh, inflammatory molecules. I mentioned that uh, part of the reason why uh, this becomes severe and, and, and leads to death in some people is that there's a huge inflammatory response of the body and we're still trying to understand like why some people go into that phase. But anyway, so to want to ramp down that inflammation, people are trying drugs like um, tocilizumab. It's in clinical trials. Yes, there's anecdotal evidence that it seems to help. 
um, but we're waiting for the results. And I think there will be some results coming out both on tocilizumab and other such uh, drugs which have been uh, tried. In fact, dexamethasone is an anti-inflammatory drug which we've had for decades. It's an old drug, uh, corticosteroid. It's a known anti-inflammatory used in many uh, diseases. So that is why the results of the recovery trial were quite uh, encouraging and quite surprising that this drug actually reduced mortality by about 30% uh, in the most severely ill patients on mechanical ventilation. So it's a broad spectrum anti-inflammatory. Some of these other drugs are more narrowly focused on against one um, cytokine. Now, um, about the patent issue, I mean, I think this is a very, very important, uh, relevant um, question that you've asked. Um, the model of um, innovation today is a market-driven model. And WHO has been saying for quite some time that it has failed public health because we've been unable to develop drugs and vaccines for diseases for which there is no commercial value. And, um, and so we've said for many years that we need to change this model. We need to think of other ways of doing research and development, which is more focused on public good and public health. Health isn't something that necessarily has to, you know, or should not be something that, um, you know, works on a market forces or on a basis of monetization. And therefore, I hope that now for this pandemic, there's been a huge um, um, solidarity in a, in a way, both from the private and the public sector, certainly from scientists across the world, there's been no holding back. It's been open sharing, open knowledge, data being put out as soon as it's available. And, um, and many of the vaccine manufacturers also saying that they would like to supply the vaccines at cost or you know, on a not-for-profit not uh, basis. Um, we also need to come together now to, and that's why this ACT Accelerator was set up and the COVAX facility that's been set up is mainly for people and countries to come together to pool the resources in one place because what that allows you to do is you pool your risk. Uh, you don't know which vaccine candidate is going to be successful. And so if a country puts all their resources into one vaccine candidate and it's not successful, then basically that country will be left with very little choice. Whereas if you pool your resources into a common pot that is able to fund a number of candidates and a couple of them hopefully will be successful, then you can also have more negotiating power on prices and have a procurement mechanism which is fair and equitable. So WHO is working on a fair allocation mechanism um, which um, we're discussing with our member states to see can countries all come to an agreement on how you share a limited uh, supply of vaccine. Let's say you have 50 or 100 million doses at the end of this year, okay? How should the world share that? Should it go only to the countries which have paid for it or are capable of paying for it to cover their own populations? Or should it go to protect frontline health workers or the most vulnerable people, whether they are the uh, el elderly or whether they are people with other diseases, and certainly frontline workers, health workers, but also other kinds of first responders are at the highest risk, as we've seen, unfortunately. We've seen huge numbers of frontline workers getting infected in many, many countries. So this is something I think the global community needs to discuss, and member states will be discussing this uh, at the WHO uh, uh, meetings that we have uh, every week with them, and hopefully we'll come to uh, uh, support a framework that's fair, that's equitable. And um, I think the patent issue is not, not uh, such a big issue because you can have different ways in which the, the p patents can be shared, um, different forms of licensing. I think the issue is more about making sure we have enough capacity to manufacture those vaccines around the world and a way of sharing them and distributing them, which is which is fair. To come to very briefly your point on immunity, uh, you know the basic in, what we call innate immunity is something that our body has and which it uses to fight any uh, new uh, attack on us, whether it's a, a virus or a back. It's a non-specific response. And how do you strengthen that? You strengthen that through good nutrition, good diet, taking enough physical exercise, avoiding tobacco, avoiding alcohol. So basically, all the things we say you know, which keep you healthy, mental 
um, stability and peace is also important. This is a time when all of us are under tremendous stress. And so we must do something which makes us uh, relax a bit. For some people, it's physical exercise. For some people, it's meditation. It could be yoga. It could be a number of, uh, of different things. Um, and, and, you know, that's why I don't like to use the word social distancing. And I prefer the, the word physical distancing. Because socially, we must connect and we must support each other. So I think that's the way in which you boost your immunity. Mood has to lo a lot to do with immunity. Neuroscientists have clearly recognized the, the connection between your me mental and your physical state. And so it's important to focus on both. Uh, thank you, Sunia. We will go now to uh, Bodhi. Can you hear us? Please don't forget to unmute yourselves. Thank you, Bodhi. Phoenix uh, Television, Chinese. Okay. Body. I think that body is not. Uh, yeah. yeah? yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Bonjour, body. Uh, go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Fine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for. Um, uh, so, Doctor, uh, I remember last interview. Uh, Sorry, from Hong Kong. Uh, I remember last interview with you. You mentioned or evaluated that the probable after twelve months. Um, the vaccination trail and safety monitoring will finish. Um, in terms of vaccines, mass uh, production and manufacturing uh, pro um, productivity and the dis uh, distribution, that is all big challenges mm. ahead of R&D. Yes. Um, my question will be, uh, who should get the priority to get it, uh, to given the vaccines? And how should it get delivery? And will WHO have a good a future plan to uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, uh, coordinate uh, with the all the issues? Thank you. Thank you. That's really a very important question and something I'd meant, referred to earlier. Um, so. The three partners, that's WHO, CEPI, and Gavi, that are working on the vaccines pillar of the accelerator, uh, the ACT accelerator, our goal is to accelerate the development of the vaccines, but also to ensure fair and equitable access. But we can only do that if the world comes together, that countries come together and agree to this mechanism. So we are proposing a framework that could be used to decide who should be prioritized. And I mentioned that they could be, you could think about groups of people who should be prioritized. You think of one group of people who are at the front line, your drivers and ambulance workers and, and other healthcare workers, of course, doctors and nurses, but also the police and, and others who do your, uh, the grocery store, uh, the sanitation workers. These are people who are exposed a lot. So you might want to protect them. There's another group of, uh, of people who are at risk because they are vulnerable to more severe disease. They are the elderly, above 65. Uh, people who have hypertension, diabetes, obesity, dementia, chronic respiratory disease or chronic kidney disease. We know that they are the ones at high risk of death. You might want to protect them. And then you might want to protect people who are in situations which are high transmission settings. We've seen in the US, the meat, meat uh, factory workers. We've seen outbreaks in prisons. We've seen um, outbreaks in nursing care homes. We've seen outbreaks in urban slums. And, um, and therefore, for in every country, there are some high risk situations where things can, um, the clusters you know, start spreading very quickly. So these are the three groups that we think about uh, prioritizing. And, um, and then we've done some calculations to see how many millions of uh, each group there are. You have to start, I think, with the most vulnerable and then progressively vaccinate more people. The goals of vaccination are to, for individual and public health. So you want to reduce mortality and illness in the community. But the second major goal is to revive economies and get people back, societies back to normal functioning. For that, you need to vaccinate larger, larger numbers of including healthy adults. So you would progressively expand the number of people vaccinated depending on how many doses you have. We're hoping that in 2021 that we will have 2 billion doses 
of a, one or two or three effective vaccines to, to be distributed around the world. It's a, there's a big if there because we don't yet have any vaccine that's proven. But because of all the investments going into this, we, let's say we will have two billion doses by the end of 2021. Um, we should be able to vaccinate at least these priority uh, populations. But a lot, WHO will propose these solutions. Member states, countries need to agree and need to come to a consensus. Uh, that's the only way that this can work. And next week, you will hear more about the COVAX facility that's being set up by the, the, the three organizations and, and many, many partners around the world, which can enable such a thing to happen because you pool resources and you also then are able to procure a large volume of uh, vaccines to distribute. Thank you, Sumia. We will take a, a next question from Christian, DPA. Christian, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Go ahead, Hello. please. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sumia, um, so many uh, groups and companies are racing to find this vaccine. Are you not afraid that uh, corners will be cut when it comes to safety? And how do you manage that risk? Because we all want that vaccine, but one puts on the market that then shows you have <coughs> one side effects or worse. Thank you for that. You've raised a very, very important point. The public will want to know this because of the rapid uh, speed at which things are being done. Are, is it possible to compromise on safety? And I think the answer is a clear no. Um, so we definitely engaging in discussions now with the developers of vaccines and others who are going to be sponsoring the trials to make sure that we have uh, standard um, endpoints and data collection mechanisms where you evaluate both the efficacy, so how effective a vaccine is, and, and safety. Now, a clinical trial, a phase three clinical trial would normally be done in tens of thousands. You may have 20, 30,000 people in a clinical trial. And that should be good enough to tell you about um, efficacy and also safety in the sense that any side effects which are quite common will be picked up. However, we know from past experience that sometimes after you start using a vaccine on much larger numbers, like hundreds of thousands of people, or this goes for drugs as well, um, you may pick up very rare side effects that are not seen in tens of thousands, but become obvious when you start vaccinating in hundreds or millions. So two things we do for that. One is what is called the surveillance, um, which means that once you start vaccinating larger populations, you still have a system in place to record those adverse events or side effects and be able to an report them and analyze them. And this is how you determine the benefit risk ratio. There is nothing in the world which is zero risk. Um, you have to balance the benefits, what you're getting by protecting people from this infection by stopping the pandemic against the potential side effects that could happen. And, and of course, we hope that the vaccine will be as safe as possible, that there'll be no side effects at all. But this can be determined over a period of time. And so it's really important for us to have those mechanisms in place in countries where the vaccine is being introduced to be able to study that even after you know it's passed its initial uh, clinical trial. So I think scientists around the world agree that accelerating the timeline does not mean compromising or taking shortcuts on safety. That cannot be done. And therefore, all the results from these vaccine trials will be examined very, very closely and carefully by WHO, but also by regulators like the FDA and the EMA and so on before a decision is made to actually um, license a vaccine. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sumia. Now we go to John Zaracostas. John, can you hear us? John? Can you unmute yourself, please? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, good. Uh, 
Uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to go back to the question of the potential candidate vaccines of the two or three that are in your more advanced stage on phase three. Which of the three would be able to be mass produced faster? Uh, I understand, I don't want to mention the brand, one of the candidates, the CEO has mentioned that uh, up to two billion uh, vaccines could be produced by this uh, uh, company alone. You mentioned earlier that you hope to have two billion vaccines by the end of 2021. Uh, this company claims that they can have two billion vaccines on their own. So if you could elaborate on the candidates and which is a potential to expedite and accelerate the production, and where did you bring in um, producers in developing countries which have the technology as well, uh, like India, Vietnam, Thailand, Brazil, etc., and uh, Cuba? Yes. Thank you for that, John. That's a, that's a great question. And again, we're working on a number of assumptions here. So I want to be very careful that uh, we, we're not sure or committing to, to certain numbers or certain timelines because it's all based on assumptions and knowledge that is changing all the time. Now, of course, we keep reading in the, in the news about um, the claims that are made by various companies, both in terms of... Uh, of their results, which sometimes are, you know, released uh, through press releases, but not yet uh, in peer-reviewed journals. And we always wait to see those results, but also about the uh, manufacturing uh, capabilities and so on. Now, of course, for the larger companies, it is um, in a way easier for them to make these projections because they know what their manufacturing capacities are. And they many of them have also uh, invested in manufacturing facilities in different parts of the world, including the countries uh, that you mentioned. So there are uh, already tie-ups going on with companies which would do uh, some of the manufacturing uh, uh, for, for these uh, large companies. There are um, vaccines like the RNA vaccines, which um, apparently are quite easy to manufacture and scale, but we know that it, Till date, we've not had an RNA or a DNA vaccine that's been used by, uh, at all in, in humans for any disease. So this would be a new one, so would go through rigorous uh, testing schedules. So for the purposes of uh, the uh, procurement and distribution, the, uh, the fair allocation, we're working on the assumption that uh, we may have a couple of hundred million doses at the end of this year, very optimistically and uh, a much larger volume, as I said, in the billions of doses in 2021 based on what we're hearing from the different manufacturers. And, and, and the COVAX group, the vaccine spiller of the accelerator, is working very closely with both the, uh, the IFPMA, the uh, International Federation of the Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Associations, which is all the large uh, vaccine manufacturers, and also the DCVMN, the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Association, which has a huge uh, capacity and capability for manufacturing, is also doing innovation. And, and we're also looking very closely at the innovation that's coming out of, of some of these countries. Uh, they may be a little further behind, but uh, you could have some good results coming from those. So it's, um, this is why we need this, this exercise of the bodies uh, sitting together. We meet every week to review what's happening, what's coming up, what the results are. The pharmaceutical companies are telling us also about the challenges and, and what they're seeing as in their own uh, uh, community. So, so this is going to be evolving all the time. And, um, and I think the next few months are going to be both interesting and challenging because we're going to start seeing some results coming out from the phase twos and uh, deciding which ones. So one thing that WHO is doing along with our partners is setting up a committee now that will look very carefully at, uh, at all of these vaccine candidates and make some recommendations for further investments because we need to have some criteria which look, of course, at the science of the vaccine candidate, but also at the public health applicability. And so we want to set up a committee that will use these uh, criteria that we've already developed that, um, uh, and the target product profiles also that have been developed by WHO expert committees to further prioritize investments in both research and development but also in procurement. Ultimately, the, uh, there'll be large procurements done 
by the COVAX facility. And that needs to be based also on, on clear uh, guidance. And it relates to the previous question that was being asked also about safety and when do you actually, um, when are you satisfied and confident that a vaccine is safe and efficacious for, for widespread use? Thank you, Sumia. Um, we have two, I will take the last two questions, one from uh, Gunilla and the last one from uh, Kate, Kate Killand. Gunilla, you have the floor. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this occasion, this possibility for us to ask questions. Um, I have one follow-up question to Christian's. It concerns the safety. You say there should be no compromise on safety, but wasn't that what happened in the case of Pandramix that was used in the influenza some years ago, uh, and that created hundreds of cases of narcolepsia in the Nordic countries where young people live with this disease for life? So how will we be able to convince people when they're going to rush for a vaccine to actually dare to take it? after having this experience with pandemic breaks. Um, and my second question is, um, how worried are you that when you have you know, billions of vaccines being produced that the virus has actually mutated, mm. so they're no longer efficient, you have to start from scratch? I mean, is vaccine really the solution to this pandemic? Thank you. Those are very deep questions, very tough questions. But um, just to go back to the issue of the safety, you know, um, I think it's really important that scientists also are able to communicate well because of the environment that um, where there are a number of people who also spread a lot of misinformation and rumors about, about vaccines. Um, so we, we have now a community which is already questioning, you know, uh, the need for a COVID vaccine, um, even before we have one. So our, our responsibility, I think, is to communicate properly what's going on and what's happening. Um, as I said before, there are, it's always a question of the benefits versus the risks. Scientists and companies, I think, do their best, should do their best to ensure to the best possible uh, confidence that they, that when they say that a vaccine is efficacious and safe, that they have done the studies to, to confirm that. But like I said, you have rare side effects, which do not, um, which you do not see when you've tested 10, 20 or 30,000 people. But when you have vaccinated half a million or a million people, you might start seeing things which you did not observe uh, initially. And so, it's really important in the initial stages of introduction of the vaccine um, post licensure that we have what is called the pharmacovigilance systems, the safety monitoring and reporting systems in place, exactly to pick up the kind of signals that you mentioned. Um, let's hope that you know some of these uh, vaccine platforms that I mentioned are tried and tested platforms which have been used for other vaccines uh, that are commonly used in, in human beings. And so we have more confidence on those platforms, uh, on the safety side. So that gives us a lot of confidence. When you have new uh, platforms, you have to be even more, more careful about these when you use new technologies in people. So it's really preparation, which is what we've started doing now, preparing for the scenario where you will be introducing a new vaccine. We've done this in the past. I, when I was in India, I remember we did this for rotavirus. There was a lot of... Uh, um, there was uh, some concern that rotavirus vaccines, oral rotavirus vaccines could lead to intersusception, a rare condition in children, but se serious condition. So the way it was introduced was that we did it in a few states first with careful monitoring. There were hospitals that were monitoring the incidence of intersusception in children because that was the expected severe side effect. And only when it was clear that there was no such association was it then scaled up to the rest of the country. So this has been done with uh, vaccines in the past, and uh, you know we can anticipate the kind of side effects that could occur from these different platforms and set up systems to monitor that. Um, second part of the question was about uh, how to convince people to take them, but I think that's related to the, to the safety. Um, I've forgotten, it was a very 
it was almost a philosophical question. Yeah. Uh, Gunilla, can you can you repeat uh, your question, the second one, or are you okay with the response already? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. What was the sec second part? I forgot. Uh, the question was on um, when you have developed and they produced millions of vaccines, how worried are you that the virus has developed and ah. the mutations? Uh, mutations. Scratching, like start from scratch again. Yeah. Again, it's a question. Very good question, something that we need to monitor. We cannot predict. So far, what we've seen from the virus uh, genome, and luckily people are depositing the whole genome sequences in public uh, gene banks, which we can see like Gisade um, and, and some of the others, GenBank. Uh, we have more than 40,000 virus sequences now that scientists are constantly uh, analyzing. Of course, uh, there are uh, drifts in the, in the sequence. Uh, all viruses mutate um, all the time. Um, luckily, this virus seems to be mutating less than the influenza virus, much, much less. And so, and it yet hasn't shown any mutations in the key areas which are either linked to uh, severity of disease or linked to um, the immune response. So far, most of the vaccines are targeting the spike protein or the so the, the so that's the key uh, part of the virus that we are watching. We don't know if it will mutate, and our vaccine development program will then have to adapt itself. Uh, you know that for influenza we have a process where every year there are strains that are collected from around the world, and then uh, the vaccine um, is based on the changes on, in those strains. So. We don't know if that will be the case, but so far, fingers crossed, it hasn't happened for this virus, and uh, and so we're okay. But one needs to keep an eye certainly on that because it can have a, a, a big Im 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 impact. So maybe um, yeah. this is something that for the future. So we will take uh, a last question. Yes. Thank you for taking the time, uh, uh, Dr. Sumia. Uh, from Kate Killand, Reuters. Kate, can you hear us? Hello, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Go ahead, Kate, and welcome from London, I guess. <laughs> yes, okay. thank you very much for taking my question. I'm interested in what you said about looking at the interim data on the HIV drugs that are um, in, with it being looked at within a solidarity trial. Are you looking at that to see whether you, sh you should continue with the trial or, or, or possibly swap other patients into that arm from the hydroxychloroquine arm? Yeah. So, <clears throat> as I said, we, we started off with five arms. You know, we had the um, standard of care arm, the remdesivir arm, the hydroxychloroquine arm, and two arms which had lopinavir, ritonavir, one with and one without interferon. Um, and, and those were selected based, as I said, on on uh, past knowledge of these drugs and uh, its effect on the SARS vi uh, coronaviruses. So currently, we know that the recovery trial, which I said is very similar to the solidarity trial, is also enrolling patients in um, tulopinavir, ritonavir. So between solidarity and recovery, we've already enrolled about, um, I think, over 3,000 patients into the lopinavir, ritonavir arm and a similar number into standard of care. So this is already a huge number and should be enough to tell us whether this drug is actually having a mortality benefit or a benefit in reducing the severity of the illness. So the, steer the executive committee of our, uh, of our trial, the solidarity trial, basically is looking at ways to maximize the generation of knowledge and moving into drugs which are promising. So. For the drug remdesivir, we still do not have a definitive answer on its impact on mortality, which is what we would like to see. We know that it reduces the duration of hospitalization. The NIH uh, trial showed that. Uh, there was a reduction of about 30 35%. We also know from a trial done by Gilead that 10 days of treatment is equal to 5 days of treatment. But what we don't know 
is whether it has a mortality benefit. And that's the most important thing to know for public health. So that is why we would like, and I think solidarity is right now the largest trial and the only trial to be looking at mortality uh, for this drug, for remdesivir. So we would like to make sure that we enroll enough patients to answer that question. And if we have enough patients already enrolled into the lopinavir ritonavir arm, between recovery and uh, solidarity, we feel that that question will be answered. And so we might, um, our committee is, is considering options uh, as to what to do next with, uh, with the remaining arms of solidarity. And as I said, then we look ahead, ahead and look at whether there are other drugs coming up that um, we, might, uh, we might want to look at. So we will, we will come back very soon on, on the further decisions on the solidarity trial. It's an adaptive design. I think it was a good way to set up a trial like this so that you, you change and adapt as you go on, but, but sticking to the core scientific principles and ethical principles of any clinical trial should do. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Swaminathan. And uh, I apologize if we were not able to take everyone on the call. Uh, it's already one hour. We will be sending you the audio file um, just shortly after we uh, wrap up. Thank you, uh, Dr. Swaminathan, for taking the time to explain all these technical and complex issues. And if you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to contact me and uh, see you uh, in the near future. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you, and thank you, Fidela, for moderating. Thank you. Bye-bye.